Okay, if, um, if you don't know already, um, I think it was, when was it, last Saturday? Last Saturday we, uh, we carried out an interesting recreation in Bristol, which we talked about last night. We, um, Annie, and, Annie and myself were chatting in, in, a, in a radical history meeting, we were looking for an anniversary which would kind of coincide with something, an event we wanted to do on the suffragette movement. And uh, we came across this event that happened in Bristol 100 years ago. Uh, actually, when is it? It's Monday, isn't it? 15th, yeah. 15th of November 19, uh, 1909, um, 100 years ago in Bristol, uh, Winston Churchill, who was current Home Secretary, Winston Churchill. <laughs> you wouldn't get that in England, would it? Anyway, uh, Winston Churchill was travelling to Bristol for a meeting. In fact, I think he was just getting off a train in the Central Station Temple Meads in Bristol and um, got onto the platform with his wife, Clementine Churchill, and um, out of the crowd ran a woman, Theresa Garnett, who was a suffragette, and she famously whipped him with a riding crop and uh, shouted out, that's for, the, that's, for the, that's for the insulted women of England. And, uh, she was dragged off um, after she'd almost pushed him onto the rails, apparently. His wife saved him. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and history might be different. But um, anyway, he, she was dragged off shouting votes for women in, in, put in, in a prison in Bristol. Um, the reason she did that was because Winston Churchill had introduced force feeding for suffragette prisoners who were on hunger strike a lot of the time. So we recreated it. If you look at our website or you come tomorrow night at the Blue Stockings, we'll show you the video, the, the, the film event. Um, but out of that came a suffragette event last Saturday, which Annie spoke, and she's going to repeat her talk now, so I'm going to hand you over to Annie. Alright, well, obviously I'm going to be talking about suffragettes, but before I get stuck into that, I'm just going to state my sources, because I'm supposed to be a historian. Um, main ones being One Hand Tied Behind Us, a book by an academic from Leeds University called Jill Liddington. Another one of her books called The Suffragette. The Ascent of Women by Melanie Phillips. The Strange Death of Liberal England by George Dangerfield. And In Letters of Gold by Rosemary Taylor. Okay, so suffragette, obviously suffrage and fran enfranchisement. We're talking the suffragette era between 1903 and 1914. And in Britain and in America, I think it's sort of a bit different in terms of who was enfranchised and who wasn't. I believe in America that women had to vote in some states at different times, but not others. Um, so to put into context, there are three main reform bills um, to enfranchise the population before 1903. One in, 19, no, no, one in 1832, Roger talked earlier about a failed one in 1831. And in 1832, this enfranchised about 20% of the adult male population, generally upper classes and like aristocracy and bourgeoisie. Another one in 1867, and then the last one in 1884. None of these enfranchised any women at all. In fact, the 1832 Reform Act was the first one to explicitly say no women at home. And after the 1884 Reform Act, like most men in Britain, a whole men from a genre of all, all of different classes had vote, but no women did. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about an, a quote that I got from a woman named Dora Montefiore, who I'll be talking about later, who was a British communist. We're talking about radical history today, as we said, about uncovering hidden histories and stuff like that, and my one is really sort of like touching on what Roger did, is challenging established narratives. The suffragettes it seems really quite radical, but we were, I think it was at his house talking about it, we were questioning really how radical were they, not just in their means, their militancy, and them chaining themselves to railings and all this, but what were they actually aiming for? So, the suffragettes were mainly run by a family called the Pankhurst family, you might have heard of, British family, who, these Pankhurst women are put up on a historical pedestal, and it's seen that women gaining the vote is generally down to their work. These women are sort of given all the credit for it, and I want to bring them down from this historical pedestal. 
doing my exams in school, I was studying suffragettes. And going through the textbooks, I was thinking, well, what on earth are working class women doing at this point? How could you have such an amazing movement that only a small number of people managed to do? From a very elite social status, it didn't really make sense. So I did a lot of research to try and find out what working class women were doing and why they aren't attributed any credit in sort of established narratives and in history as we know it. Pankhurst and suffrage, and suffrage have become synonyms in Britain and they really shouldn't be. And the contribution of other female activists and groups have been really marginalised and they need to be rehabilitated. And we need to think really about how much the suffragette movement really contributed towards wider feminism, not just enfranchisement. <coughs> a little bit of a brief history. There are two main types of suffrage campaigning. The original battle for suffrage for women in England started in 1865 with the suffragists. Our suffragists are peaceful campaigners. They use sort of constitutional methods, they petition, they lobby MPs. And their organisation is called the National Union for Women's Suffrage Societies. Now these women have gained small victories in regards to getting women more involved in public life. But, as we said, in 1865 they started their campaign, and yet in 1903, when the suffragettes are really set up, women still don't have the vote. That's almost 40 years of campaigning. The second type of campaigner is a suffragette. Their um, organisation is called the Women's Social and Political Union, Again, this is founded in 1903 by the Pankhurst family in Manchester, and it becomes militant from 1905 onwards. <coughs> Suffragette, the word, was a phrase sort of coined by the Daily Mail at the time. It was seen as quite, being used as quite a derogatory word, like et meaning little, to try and put down these women and what they were thinking, but they, right, took it on and they said, no, we're not going to stand for that, we're going to use it, use it as our identity. <laughs> so Pankhurst family then, in the middle there is Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughter Christabel Pankhurst. Emmeline, Christabel, Sylvia and Adela were the main founders of this militant movement. They were the wife and the daughters of a sort of left-wing politician who died in 1897 called Richard Pankhurst. And the society to begin with really sort of embraces left-wing, more sort of that way leaning, that way inclined policies and convictions. Their first aim is to try and recruit more working class women and to try and put pressure on the IRP, the Independent Labour Party at the time. But as you'll see later on, they seem to move away from this. And then you start to question, well, how radical really were they? <coughs> okay, so thinking about how radical a group is, you could think about, well, how does it structure itself? Is it a democracy? Is it an autocracy? And the Women's Social and Political Union, which I'm going to be calling the WSPU because it's a bit of a mouthful, is run under a system of hierarchy. So women at sort of rank and file, they don't have much of a say in what goes on. Emmeline and Christabel and Sylvia are the central committee of the group. And they basically have a subcommittee who are their friends and family to help them make decisions. And at home sessions where they invite women to come and sort of sit around and they can discuss the ideas they've come up with and how they want to initiate them. And then 11 regional officers who be going around the country and telling women of all these different branches what to actually be doing, what they've decided. But I think what's really important to note straight away is that this is a group that is campaigning for democracy and to be part of a democracy of a country in which they live. But straight away they don't practice that within their own organisation, which I think is quite strange. It was one of the first reasons that I started to question how radical the suffragettes and their organisation really were. It's been quite critiqued as quite hypocritical the fact that they weren't democratic themselves. Emily 
had her explicitly stated that she wanted her women to walk in step and take their instructions like an army, which I think really sums up their approach to how they're going to structure the organisation. 